Welcome to the Mad Profit Podcast, where we interview active investors, entrepreneurs, and experts who left corporate jobs to buy or start successful ventures and live life on their own terms. Listen to their stories, learn from their experiences, and heed their advice so you too can create mad profits and the life you've always wanted. And now, here's your host, Laurent Truc. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Mad Profit Podcast. My name is Laurent Truc, and today I've got a special guest that I've known for a very long time. I've uh, actually been hounding him to, to get on my podcast. Uh, because he spent a lot of time with a lot of technology companies out there. And uh, today we want to talk about technology and, and kind of pick his brain. So uh, please help me welcome Ashu Avasti, the head of digital transformation at Grant Thornton. Ashu, welcome aboard. How are you? Thanks, Laurent. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, looking forward to the, the conversation. Appreciate you making the time. And uh, yeah, sorry I hounded you, but <laughs> glad you're here now. <laughs> Um, so actually, I, I wanted you on here because you've had a um, pretty long career in technology and in sales. You've helped a lot of businesses uh, grow. Some were very, very small businesses in their very early years uh, to you know large corporations. So you've seen kind of that uh, growth that a company goes through from a technology perspective. Um, and obviously, in your role today, you're seeing more and more of that. And I think you can provide a, a lot of advice to our listenership. So I'm, I'm glad to have you here. I think it'll be great. No, nope, looking forward to it, for sure. So why don't we get started? Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how uh, you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, I'll keep it brief. But, uh, you know, my background has always been in technology by, you know, kind of by training, by schooling, uh, computer science and engineering background, uh, although I never really wanted to be a hardcore engineer, but I certainly loved the puzzle pieces of technology. And, and as a result, uh, throughout my career, I've held various types of roles, whether it's been uh, product development, whether it's been in sales leadership, whether it's been in operations. Uh, they've always been either in technology companies or um, in and around technology. And when I say technology, it's everything from networks, to software as a service, to delivering on e-com platforms, building out e-commerce uh, companies. I've got a couple of stints doing that. Uh, consulting, helping grow sales teams, grow markets, uh, all those types of things. Uh, you know, in, in there, uh, some of the, what I would say, probably big stints were at you know, Bell, Bell Canada, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, at LinkedIn, uh, now here at Grand Thornton. Uh, as part of our digital practice where we have a lot of fun and spend a lot of our days is working with um, small to medium to growing size businesses, uh, helping them figure out how to leverage technology to, to grow their business. And that can be across any kind of segment, whether that's manufacturing, whether that is e-commerce, whether that is retail, uh, we, uh, we really learn, uh, know, have the team and ex experience to, to help clients with that. So bringing all that knowledge and I get to basically play with puzzles and put them together um, as my day job. That's awesome. Sounds like a lot of fun. So let, let's start. Um, what should a company consider when they're looking at their technology platform today? And if you can break that up from kind of a smaller size business to a larger size business, like where do they start? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. So, you know, maybe I'll use as a case example, um, just an e-com site. You know, maybe you're, you know, at the end of the day, the, the critical thing is we don't start from a place to say, uh, I'm going to go get technology for the sake of getting technology or because it's a cool and flashy thing. It sounds a little, you know, silly to kind of make that statement, but you'd be surprised how often um, that really does happen. And when you look at actually a client's uh, growth curve uh, from small to all to the whole process, you'll actually see along the way that they've made technology choices uh, to solve a pain point at a certain time. And so let's say you start, you know, day one, um, it's two people, a dog in the garage building a business. 
uh, which is great. But then, you know, you, you start to get a little bit of revenue, you start to, you know, build a little bit of capacity. And then you're like, oh, well, we need, uh, we need something to send emails out to people. So you, you get a small little marketing system, SurveyMonkey, you get a subscription, and you start to, you start to email out to people. Oh, well, how do I keep track of addresses? How do I keep, there's, there's all these things, as you start to get bigger and bigger, you start to solve leveraging technology along the way. So the first thing, no matter what, and what stage you are, whether you're small early on, or uh, if you're mid-sized or you know, you're, you've been, even been around for a while, is you really need to step back, leverage some you know, expertise or experience in your network, people you know, um, you know, solicit information, try to get an assessment of your, your, your business. Where, where can advantages be, be had? I'm not suggesting everyone run out and go hire a consultant. Uh, what I'm suggesting, though, is that you pause and you actually try to conduct some research either by yourself or through networking groups, through forums like this, where, you know, you can have a 10 minute conversation with someone who says, hey, I'm coming across this problem now. Have you heard or seen solutions? The idea is that you do have to build a plan, right? Uh, when you start to do the point solution, I'm going to get one little piece of technology that solves my problem today. Well, a week later, you're going to buy another piece of technology that when could, that could, you could have probably forecast or seen coming up. Mm, uh, sure. So part of it is just building a plan. How do you how do you build a plan? And so how does how does a business know when they're they're just plugging up holes with technology versus okay, we've plugged up so many holes that maybe we should look for something more end to end, like an ERP that integrates our CRM. Cause I think a lot of small businesses, it's exactly what you said. It's okay, man, my taxes are a nightmare. Let me get a tax software. Let me, you know, I, I can't keep uh, sending out these emails out of outlook. How do I centralize that differently? Right? So um, when do they kind of figure we need something more end to end? What drives that? So, you know, in the past, and I would even say as little as five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, but, you know, probably as even as little as five years ago, for small business to enter into, you know, the notion of things like ERP and for our audiences, ERP is a basically large end-to-end -end system that looks from all the way from customers coming in, you're ordering product, maybe you're shipping product. You're all the way through your accounting and, and finances and your general ledger. Uh, you know, in the past, you kind of needed the big player, right? The SAP, the Oracle, those were the mm -hmm. names that people knew. And uh, you needed, to, like, you, like you couldn't get out of bed for less than, you know, $5 million, you know. But certainly over the last five to 10 years, definitely in an accelerated over the last five years, the market space has changed so much that, Technology has actually democratized the business's ability to actually access that technology. So as an example, you can get a lot of that big business feature and function in a system that is based in the cloud and maybe is only for the five employee company that you are currently running, right? And, you know, your cost of entry just might be $200 a month. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a lot of that feature and function, you know, and it'll scale with you, right? It'll scale with you to your, you know, your, your dream big and you're a thousand person company. But the key thing is you got to have a plan and you've got to work with people to understand, okay, here's my business. And it isn't just about the technology is what's your business goal? What is mm -hmm. your three to five year goal? What, where are you trying to get to? Because then based on, you know, where you're trying to get to, what does your cash flow look like? You know, are you looking at investors? Is there, you know, at some point, are you looking for investors? Is your plan to build a certain amount of business and then exit or sell it? Like this all has to be part of your plan because then we can determine what is the best fit technology. What are the pieces that over the next three to five years are, I'll say with 80% certainty, likely to continue to meet your needs so that you're not having to retool your business. Right. And, and is there a strong change management component with that technology? Um, like I know years ago, I, I actually did SAP implementations as my first thing out of school. And it was, 
five year, two year to five year implementations, they were massive and the entire organization had to change, like, you know, adopt this new process. And that was a big part of it. What, what's your view on change management for in this day and age when the smaller technology faster, more nimble? The, so change management, um, the need for change management and the detail that it'll be will increase in the same proportion as, you know, the age of your company in business. So if you wait till you've gone from two people, a garage and a dog, mm -hmm. and now you are a 25 person office setting, you know, $5 million, $10 million revenue business, and then you've decided to make your, your technology choice. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't get it done. Doesn't mean there aren't solutions, but it does mean that there is, there will be a, um, change management will be a big part of it because you've been doing it for a certain way mm -hmm. for whatever period of time. And now how do you get everyone to move to the new way of doing it? Uh, is really it is, now the bigger you get and the longer it's been, the more that that change management sure. is going to be really critical to your, um, you know, your, your quantum leap here when you're introducing the technology. And that's why the plan, it doesn't mean you have to buy all the technology day one, but if you have a plan along the way, and some pieces may, see the great thing about a lot of the technology that exists today is that they also, they're modular, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to buy all the features, all the functions, all the modules all at once. You can buy the entry piece, let's say CRM and market and contact management, right? You have customers, you want to communicate with them, you want to record, uh, you know, there, and I'm starting, I was like starting on the customer side because that's really where we get paid and that's where we deliver value no matter mm -hmm. what you do. But, you know, you think of customer management or contact management, you can start there and then you can still use a, you know, separate small accounting system, but that system, that CRM system later on as you're growing probably has a module that bolts on things like order management, inventory management. It can, you know, later on in the cycle, you can bolt on the accounting package that goes with it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you, you've planned that I will need these things along the way and you'll invest in them in, you know, in the right cadence of, of your cash flow and your growth, but you don't have to buy it, but you plan for it and you don't have to buy it all at once. And as a result, you're actually telling people, hey, things are going to change. We have this module, but if we get to here, guys, we're going to buy this module and it's going to make things easier, but we've got to get there first. Yeah. So uh -huh. you already start to introduce the concepts of change management and, and it will make it significantly easier as you go through the process. Are there, um, are there gates that you think through? So a company that is under $1 million should have these two or three pieces of technology. And then if you're a million to 10 million, you're, you know, you should have evolved into this. Cause I find a lot of people, it's also a balance of cost, right? And so often mm -hmm. I see businesses trying to muscle it with what they have and their employees get frustrated. And, and there's a very simple and obvious solution that's just a couple hundred dollars more a month away, but they're deciding not to. So how do you, how do you balance that? And what, what do you, when should people start saying, okay, it's time we need to go look at the next thing? Well, certainly, um, the thresholds that we have seen, uh, or at least I've seen over, over my career, uh, interestingly enough, are kind of one, five, 10, 20 plus, right? Okay. And where I'll break that down. Uh, so the 1 million, getting to the 1 million, that's, that is your first tranche, right? You are typically bootstrapping. It is just you, your friend and a dog mm -hmm. in a garage and a dream. Uh, you are typically personally vested in terms of uh, financial uh, investment, right? It's typically your personal time or money that's invested in the endeavor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you are trying to, to get to that break even, you know, obviously profit, but the first tranche is getting into that break even. And the break even when you start to look at material cost, also opportunity cost of your time versus employment or, or what have you. Uh, that million dollar mark is typically the first gate that everyone's trying to trying to hit. Uh, okay. Once you hit that first gate, you typically have uh, you start to get into a place where uh, you may have uh, a little bit of cash flow, like a little bit of predictable cash flow, um, and you are starting to eye volume and capacity. Uh, that is typically your first tranche of really starting to look at, okay, 
do I have the right technology to get me from one to five? Mm. Because getting from one to five is typically a straight numbers game and you cannot throw bodies at it. So here's the challenge you'll have. You'll have to get to, if it was two, uh, you know, you, a friend and, you know, a garage and a dog that got you to a million, mm -hmm. it's probably you, a friend, um, the gardener part-time one day a week and the dog and, and the dog's friend that's going to get you to 5 million. Mm -hmm. So really what you do need to figure out is how do you, cause then you start to look at profit and net income. How do I get my, you know, my business that is generating maybe 1 million of top line revenue. I'm kind of breaking even, or maybe a little bit, even positive cash flow. How do I start to increase my profit and revenue? Right. So I just, I don't want to get to 5 million and still be at break even because you're going to have to put, you know, five times more time into it. Yeah. And you don't want to just throw bodies. Traditionally, people will just throw bodies at it. Right. And there's a balance between the two, but that is definitely certainly the first tranche where you're going to want to really, if you're planful and you're able to, to actually um, leverage some technology to help with the scaling, your profit will improve. And then once you get to the five to 10 mark, then you're typically, um, you're self-funded, you're right, you're self-funding, the business itself has enough cash flow, the business itself is building, you know, credit history, has it, it, it's its own tax entity, mm. it, all those pieces of the business are there now. And this is from five to 10, where we see just natural growth in segment, people are, you're more customers, you're, you know, you start to spend a little bit on advertising, you're starting, whether it's digital or otherwise, um, you know, you're spending more time on you know paid adwords you're starting to you're starting to leverage you start to reinvest into the business in a, in a way that you can afford and still have an income uh, but traditionally what we've seen is it works really well and then you kind of hit the 10 million dollar threat ceiling mm -hmm. and then you kind of bounce off it and you come down you bounce off it and you come down and that 10 million dollar mark is really the big one that is hard to, to cross and it typically is another leap either in technology process, people, tools. But once again, you can do it. Change management is going to be a little bit harder there, right? right. Mm -hmm. Had you planned ahead of time, sometimes that, that transition past the $10 million mark uh, can be uh, easier or more efficient. Are there a lot of technologies that you can start as a solo entrepreneur that can be leveraged all the way through to 10 million or once you get to 10 million you're really talking about okay scrap the technology used up until now now we're going to have to get into you know full erp we're going to have to get into you know much bigger uh types of systems not necessarily um i mean now with the notion i mean everyone's heard of you know in the cloud it's it's almost cliche now mm -hmm. but the truth of the matter is now that cloud solutions are the norm right? It does allow that single entrepreneur who's growing, if done planfully, you know, generally speaking, they can stay on the same platform and, and continue to grow. You know, if we look at something like Salesforce as an example, obviously, I mean, Salesforce is a huge CRM provider. They own, they were the first ones to take CRM in the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 20 years ago. They, you know, started in CRM, they do a number of things now. And if you think about it, they're, they're like the Apple store. Everybody's got an app for Salesforce. Yeah. So you've got a platform now that you can start with as little as one license, mm -hmm. two licenses. And we know that it will, if, as your business grows, Salesforce can scale. And then they have different apps and modules along the way that can integrate into that platform. And there are multi-billion dollar companies running on Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So, and there are, you know, several one person, two person, three person, five person shops running on Salesforce. So yes, absolutely. You can start small at something that you can afford if you're planful about it. And then you can plan, you know, and then, you know, that's the key thing uh, is start, you know, do that research, leverage networks, leverage, you know, ton of knowledge and that's out in the in the marketplace um same applies for things like e-com sites or you're looking to you know e-com is a big piece of anything anyone's going to do whether mm -hmm. you're selling a product or a service you're going to establish a website you're going to want to you know share information about yourself if people are engaging with your web assets you're going to want to track that you're going to want to be able to communicate with them and so you know that e-com e piece of it has to be part of your strategy and you're going to want to link those in as well
Very cool. Very cool. Tell me about what's, what's kind of the hot topic right now, right? So we're hearing in, in technology, we're hearing, you know, AI, we're hearing all these other, these other things. Um, are, are you, are you getting customers coming to you say, Hey, I got to get into this space. I'm not doing anything here. Uh, or like, talk to me about this, this kind of new wave of stuff coming out. So certainly you've hit a hot topic. That's definitely out in the marketplace, uh, which is AI. Everyone's mm-hmm. talking about it, right? Uh, from the small, and like I said earlier on, the great thing about technology these days is that, you know, it has been democratized so that everyone can get access to it. Mm-hmm. But before we jump into AI, I just want to make a, like a small distinction, uh, but really important distinction is that there's a journey that AI goes on. And I think, you know, naturally when we think of AI, we think of, you know, science fiction movies and the notion of things like cyborgs and things completely running autonomously. But really the journey starts uh, with what is called RPA or robotic process automation. So no differently than, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, as robots were brought into auto manufacturing or manufacturing in general to be efficient, safer, less error, um, to do the same process over and over again. Maybe it's, it's bending a piece of metal. Maybe it's welding a, p- a particular joint. Well, the fact is that robot can repeat it. You know, it's a repeatable exercise and that robot can repeat that exercise within a, you know, 1% degree of difference each time they do it. Right. And it, it, they can obviously do it at a different efficient rate mm-hmm. and they can do it safer. So robotic process today in our digital world, we all, have digital processes. So at companies, it might be downloading reports. It might be, oh, I've got to take download my sales report and load it into my accounting software so that my accounting software can then do invoices and then I'm, you know, APAR. Uh, or if you're bigger, maybe I have a lot of invoices coming in and I need to, those invoices to be processed. Well, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm entering them into my accounting software or whatever. Well, the first entry point is robotic process automation. All these manual digital processes can be fully automated now, right? And the cost of entry into getting those types of automation um, is low. It's not extremely high. You don't have to buy a whole new platform for yourself. And so when you see a lot of tools out there, actually, whether they're in the cloud, pieces of software, they are all leveraging a bit of RPA in the background to make your life easier, right? And then what you start to go to the next phase, which is what we call learning bots, right? Mm -hmm. Bots that start to learn activity that's happening. The common example I like using here is chat bots. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to a website, you see the little, you know, chat bot icon pop up. When nine times out of 10, there isn't a human behind that, right? Right. That's a, that's an, that's a chat bot slash AI that is, um, you know, based on an algorithm and a number, you know, pattern recognition, language recognition is running an algorithm and interacting with someone to a certain point. Mm-hmm. And then maybe it needs to move to a salesperson. So here's a great example of where a one person shop or a two person shop could leverage something like a chatbot interacting with potential clients, uh, uh, potential prospects on their website. So you're, you're, you're able to address a large number of people at one time and then the chatbot will filter to you when ready, the person who's ready to make a purchase or needs that further inquiry or, or what have you. So you, you are, you're able to t- ingest more than if you were the one managing the text line or the chat line, right? right? Individually. So and it's, th- this is where we start. To, yeah. That's good. It's actually crazy how many sites now have a chat box on them. Like, you know, I, I know some, exactly. some owners that are one person shops and yeah. The, the price of that technology have gone down so much that it's like he said, it's like having three employees that are working 24 hours a day. It's, it's awesome. 100%. And it goes back to what I was saying is that they're taking an intensely manual mm-hmm. digital process and automating it. Right. And then you start to layer in some learning, some machine learning. Um, you start to layering, layering in some of the AI. Uh, and then cause when we start talk about AI, really what we're talking about is at some point, the algorithm is actually making a decision for you, mm-hmm. right? That's different. So when you start to get into that's that's where we get to the higher, the, you know, the more science fiction oriented, but you know, uh, where AI is actually conducting decisions for you, credit 
let, for example, maybe you're applying for credit cards. So what people don't realize is when you're applying for credit cards, there's a lot of RPA and AI in the background. You're filling in your form online. It's going through the system. The algorithm is actually proofreading the, the, the application to make sure that it's correct. The addresses make sense. It's double checking and if there's an issue, it'll send it back to you. If it's good, it'll move it on to the next part in the process. You may have another algorithm that's reviewing all the information and then making a red, yellow, green decision in terms of, yeah, I think this, you know, this credit application looks good or this credit card application looks good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this one doesn't, it might go to an adjudicator. That's no different for your business, a small business, right? There are co companies that may be applying for credit because you're selling them a hard good. Right. So you right. want to because they're buying such a large amount, um, maybe you're selling a hard good and you want to make sure and they want credit terms or that maybe they're not buying on a credit card or transacting. The fact is that you can actually start to figure this stuff out. Then, I mean, other options around AI and, and RPA is reporting and analytics. There's so much data out there. How do you ingest it? Mm -hmm. You know, while Excel is still one of the number one analytical tools out there, you know, as a one person, two person, three person, five person shop, can you afford to spend five days a week trudging through reports to try to figure out who your best customers are, or maybe where the best areas to be shipping and delivering are, or where you maybe need to change in your pricing strategy? Well, no, the answer is no, yeah. <laughs> but there is, you know, reporting software out there leveraging AI and things like RPA that start to give you a leg up back to, I can, I can have all the strength and intelligence of big business, but at a cost that makes sense for me at small business, right? Mm -hmm. I find it's getting infused in everything. I, I had an Amazon store and we actually bought uh, a software that would leverage AI to figure out what pricing, to, to optimize the pricing of advertising through, uh, through the channel. Yep. So it, it's crazy. It's getting infused in literally every piece of software out there now. It's nuts. Yep. No, nope, absolutely. Very good. Is there anything else? So AI is a, a big one. Any other kind of the cloud is, is no longer new, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I think, you know, part of this too is, you know, the, the notion it's kind of, I'd put it, if I were to bucket it in, in three A's, AI is the big buzzword, mm -hmm. but where you really want to see AI or RPA is how's it helping you in your marketing automation? How is it helping you? So when you look at solutions, is there automation? Maybe the easiest way to think of it is, is there automation? I'm looking to communicate with my clients on a regular basis, you know, whether it's newsletter, offers, advertisements, what have you. Do, is there a software that allows for automation? Mm -hmm. Can I program it to a certain degree that allows it to interact? Meaning if I send a, a certain piece of work uh, or advertising or material, Seven days later, if it hasn't been clicked, can I send it again? Um, if it has been clicked, can I send a follow-up piece of information that I think the client might be relevant based on maybe other links within the article or the piece of information I sent to them? Is there a different piece of information I want to send, send to them? So this type of sales and marketing automation, once again, allows you to be a 10, 20, 30 employee business but only be two or three people because you're able to interact with larger people, you know, a greater amount of people. Then as you're processing or your order processing, is it done automation or someone actually entering stuff to get stuff shipped out or um, schedule time? Are you using scheduling automation? Are you rolling this stuff automatically into your accounting system so that you're not manually every night at the end of the day entering in a whole bunch of accounting records to make sure you're tracking all of right. this stuff properly? So, one of the big, the key thing is in these big tranches, I would say customer, uh, what I call sales and marketing automation, order management and processing and accounting. Are you taking advantage of automated processes or workflows to make it much more efficient, lower degree of error, uh, and allows you to scale as you go? Those are the things that you really want to kind of look at. Very cool. Cool. So actually, what are some of the biggest technology mistakes that companies make today? Uh, biggest technology mistake, uh, I, was, I was just thinking about recently with all the stuff that's going on right now, an airline that should not be mentioned, uh, released an entire customer management and reservation system uh, without actually having tested it with the users. So the, the actual customer service agents had no training on it oh. and they released it and they literally shut down their reservation, they started to shut down their phone numbers. And 
I mean, it's, it's a mistake of epic proportions, but you know, in every example of a bad technology mistake, what you will see consistently, whether it is a really big company, whether it's a small company, it's did you follow the, the plan and the pro did you have a plan? And if you had a plan, did you follow that plan and mm-hmm. the process? Typically, see the good thing about technology and because there's so much information out there is there are generally accepted, it's, uh, if you use accounting as an example, gap, right? Generally, you know, generally accepts accounting practices. Well, with technology rollout, with vendor selection, with, you know, actually implementation, there are generally accepted processes and practices you need to go through, steps you need to go through, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the question is, don't try to shortcut it. Like, it's okay, it's okay if it's going to take a little bit longer. The biggest mistake people make is that in a rush to solve a problem, they find the quickest or first available technology solution. And as a result, you know, it may be an immediate potential um, solve to the pain, but there's a longer term, you know, challenge that you end up facing there. So, I mean, really simply, the mistake in technology decisions is rushing to make one versus taking the time to actually go through the process. Yeah. So, so do you have a, I mean, I'm sure Grant Thornton has a methodology, but do you recommend a methodology for small businesses when they're looking at, we need a new CRM or some sort of platform? Like how should they, to make sure that it's a robust kind of approach that they take? Yeah. So if we, if we're look go out into the, into the, you know, the broader internet sphere. And if you're searching for, you know, um, knowledge articles or things like that, you know, you do want to uh, look for, and there's lots of stuff on this, right? You want, you want to like, you know, vendor selection process. That's a key or, or software selection process. Mm -hmm. Uh, You'll hear things like agile methodologies, right? Where you take an iterative approach. You're not trying to do this big bang, solve the whole world at one time, but you're trying to solve small problems along the way and you keep, you keep going back and retooling. This is analogous to what I was saying about you can start with a smaller entry level solution that can grow with you over time, right? Cause as you improve your processes. So, you know, look for articles and information around agile methodologies around vendor selection, around software selection, then you're going to get into maybe if you're looking specifically CRM, you know, there's lots of articles around, how to select the best CRM software. So the fact is there's actually a lot of knowledge articles out there to say, hey, how should I really be looking at my business? But my counsel would be start broader. How do I start an online business? What are the things I should consider? You know, start with a broader plan and then you can start to, because there's going to be other things other than just technology, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, how do you manage cash flows? How do you, should I go get an accountant? Should I have a bookkeeper? Like there's going to be a number of things, you know, that impact your business. And there's a lot of knowledge articles out there and saying, you know, here are the steps that you should go through. You know, here's generally accepted steps one through five that you should go through. It at least triggers thinking, right? It it triggers, okay, here are the things I need to consider before and then you certainly then you you can go out into the network uh, whether it's LinkedIn um, whether it's your own personal network uh, guarantee that there are there's lots of user groups out there and lots of um, uh, places where you can actually have discussions with people mm-hmm. around what are the best practices right how are you leveraging social media as part of yours and when I say social media I don't mean just uh, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter uh, but are you leveraging you know if, who's your audience? Are you leveraging TikTok? Are you leveraging mm-hmm. LinkedIn? Like, you know, there's so much social media out there and there's so many different applications. Which one is the right one for you, right? Uh, so that's also going to be relevant. Who's your audience segment? Uh, all that type of stuff, you know, and you can, and there's lots of knowledge articles out there on that. It almost sounds overwhelming. Uh, but I think the point is don't do it in a vacuum. <laughs> like research, yeah, exactly. get other people involved, you know maybe a consulting firm if, uh, if you're at that level, right? Exactly. At the right time and right place, you may want to look at, you know, consulting firms, but there's even, you know, truth be known, there's, there's even smaller, you know, consultants out there, independent consultants, back to the, you know, uh, uh, two people, a garage and a dog. 
Um, you know, there's small consulting firms out there, uh, what we call you know, single shingle or two shingle um, people who are just, just want to help and, you know, they can be your individual consultant. Sometimes they can even help be a, a temporary kind of employee that helps with a certain aspect right. of um, a change that they're trying to, to, to uh, put in place. Perfect. Um, any last recommendations for somebody who uh, maybe thinks, hey, it's time for me to take a look at my technology footprint and, and maybe improve it? What would you, what would you say to that person? Uh, uh, I would say make sure you have a plan. Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would definitely say uh, know what your financial plan is, right? Like that's, that's got to be critical. What's mm -hmm. your financial cash flow plan, investment plan? Uh, what does your spend plan look like over the course of a 12, 18, 24 month horizon? Uh, cash is king because you can't grow a business if you don't have money. Mm -hmm. So I would always say have that plan first, have that fiscal plan. Then the next step is how can I leverage technology? How can I leverage automation that allows me to have the lowest cost but the most impact? right? Uh, whether that it be in presence or scale, uh, but get that fiscal plan done first. And then, uh, you know, technology, how can that, because technology ultimately will be your most cost effective way mm -hmm. to create scale. It's interesting you should say that. So is, is there like a rule of thumb that your technology spend should be X your profit or X your revenue? Yes. Uh, you'll, you'll hear lots of sort of numbers out there in terms of uh, you know, technology spend. I, I want to be careful when we say technology spend too, is you may have, let's use accounting as an example. Mm -hmm. You'll have an accounting, you know, package, you know, if you're big enough, you're going to be having an accounting package or an accounting person. Well, that's not really technology. That's table stakes. Mm -hmm. Like you, it's, you can't not have, um, uh, an accounting package to, to, to manage your finances. You, you know, the notion of, uh, I like using the email, um, you have Outlook or whatever email, a Google suite, and you're paying money for it. Do I consider that a technology investment? No, because the notion of not having it is, it, it, yeah. it's so part of mainstream, that's not a technology investment. So I just want to qualify when we say technology investment, we do mean investment that is over and above what we call table stakes to run your business, right? This isn't your email. This isn't your website. This isn't, you know, I mean, you can kind of incorporate it in there depending, but uh, you're probably looking at about five to 10% and then it can scale differently. Uh, but you are probably looking at about an, on average, you should plan for a part of your spend um, should be about 10% on 10%. technology. Okay. Very good. That's super helpful. Um, actually, this was great. Uh, if somebody would like to get in contact with you with more questions, what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, best way I am on LinkedIn. Uh, so you will easily find me. Uh, but, uh, and I have a, like I said, I'm on our public Grant Thornton website and my contact information is there as well. So, and I'm sure with the, this podcast, you'll send out, uh, my, my information as well. Yep. They'll be in, uh, in the meeting notes. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. This has been uh, eye opening and very informative and I uh, hope to get you back on at, uh, at a future state. If we've got some more technology questions, if you're open to it. I would love to. Awesome. All right, Ashley, thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah. it. Take care. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, bye. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the mad profit podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or the listening platform of your choice. Also, check us out at madxcapital.com for more useful information and resources to help you achieve your investing, entrepreneurial, and business goals. See you next week on the Mad Profit Podcast.